All right. Well, thanks for joining us for the 2022 Learning Trends Report, Informing Strategies for Success. We're thrilled to have so many of you able to join us. This is um, a report that has um, several years behind it now, so we're excited to have this discussion today. If you are a um, social media fan, we encourage you to join us. Uh, Fiasha is in the background, she'll be live tweeting today. The hashtag is LT2022 and uh, logistics will save time for Q&A at the end and everyone who registered today will receive the recording. So no worries if you have to drop early or get disconnected. For those of you who are new to the Tier 1 family, we're a consulting firm here headquartered out of Covington, Kentucky, but with offices nationally. We are focused on strategy activation through people, and often that involves learning and performance teams. So, um, you know, any of those solutions that help with digital transformation or any transformation, your talent and people strategies, um, operational efficiency. We are here to help um, your organization perform at its highest and grow. So with we want to thank behind the scenes. We have Michelle as our producer today. As I mentioned, Fiasha will be uh, sharing out the insights. And um, we have an amazing panel of our authors for today. Will, Zach, Walter, thanks so much for being here. And so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Will to get us started. Great, Sarah. Well, <clears throat> let me uh, take two seconds to introduce myself and then Walter and Zach uh, can do the same. I'm Will Tallheimer. Uh, if you want to get me excited about talking about something interesting, you know, talk to me about learning science or the performance sciences or learning evaluation. Um, really get me jazzed on those things. Uh, I've been in the field a long time, and I'm a principal here at Tier 1. I help people, uh, like we all do at Tier 1, uh, help people do their best work. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Zach, since you're next there in line. Sure thing, next to you, uh, at least digitally. Um, welcome everybody, Zach Ryland. I work at Tier 1 here, mostly in the role of learning strategist, instructional designer, and what we call performance experience designer, um, which is just our way of kind of thinking about the convergence of performance sciences like design thinking or neuroscience. Um, and like Will said, um, if I can answer like the things that get me jazzed, it's great design, intentional thinking about behavior change, and in today's case, you know, the meaningful data that can drive decisions for how we think about ourselves as learning professionals. Uh, with that, Walter, why don't you take it away? Hi, uh, Walter Warwick, also a principal at Tier 1. My day job is actually spent building computational models of human performance, so I'm definitely the third wheel in this crew. Uh, but I do like to, to look at data and see how that, whether that surprises us. I'm a Bayesian at heart, not, a, not an inferential statistician, but an opportunity like this to sort of take the temperature of the community and see if we can learn more than just sort of simple percentage breakdowns is, is something that I get excited about. So uh, I defer to both Zach and Will for the smart stuff, but I'll try to add color commentary where I can. Yeah, right, right, Walter. <clears throat> okay. so. Uh... Why don't we uh, click forward one thing. What is Learning Trends 2020? Well, it is a report. This report this year is over 100 pages. Now, obviously, in today's session, we're not going to be able to go through all 100 pages. Um, our goal here today is to dip into a few of the areas, uh, get you intrigued, get you interested, also talk about um, how we think that you might be able to use this report for your own uh, learning for your own learning team. Uh, we surveyed 377 LNP learning performance professionals um, from around the world. I will tell you that the respondents tended to lean toward uh, United States, Canada for the most part, then Europe, and then the rest of the English speaking world. We found our uh, respondents tended to be fairly highly experienced overall, a lot of people, um, and had a lot of uh, sort of seniority in, in their work, work role. Um, we designed this report. Uh, we didn't just want to survey people. We really wanted to create something 
uh, <clears throat> that would enable you and your learning team to think about your work, reflect on it, and uh, really take it as an opportunity to build your own uh, capabilities. Uh, I, I know it's now my role. We're gonna we're gonna give you a little sense of this. I know a lot of you probably answered some of these questions, and we thank you for that. Um, but we're gonna give you a chance to answer three questions now uh, before we get started, and uh, then you'll see these questions as we go forward. So, poll question number one: Those of you who are less familiar with Zoom, you should be seeing kind of a pop up now that has these questions for you. And I guess you can answer all three of them at once. Pretty cool. And Michelle, our wonderful producer, if you'll just give us a heads up as we start to get answers in from our 91 participants here, we'll, we'll get a sense of when we should keep going. And uh, Zach and Walter, I just noticed there's a little red line at the bottom that says hosts and panelists cannot vote. So we're out of luck. No voice. <laughs> no voice. <laughs> uh, oh well. It looks like the results are starting to come in now, so we'll just give it a few, um, just a little bit longer here. Thanks for that, Sarah. I mean, we're doing a fun social experiment here. We'll see how representative this group's data is in comparison to the broader report. Well, and also one of the things I should mention um, is that we surveyed people in January of this year and the month before, December of the previous year. So that's when our data was collected. And it is possible um, that things have changed a little bit for you uh, over time as well. Awesome. Michelle, it looks like we have about 70 responses. So if you want to go ahead and close it out, I think we could move on. Mm. Oh. Okay, and we're not going to hint at what the uh, survey answers were, but uh, it looks like for question one, uh, general interest learning was the top vote getter. And for question two, uh, the highest answers look about the same. I will work almost exclusively from home or work mostly from home, but also at the office. And then for question three, uh, the highest answer is I do not know enough to say. Uh, how successful was your learning team in creating learning opportunities that improved employee work performance? That's a great uh, sense of honesty there. Uh, the second answer was we have no real uh, data on that. All right, let's take us forward. All right, so before we begin, just a few special thanks. Uh, first of all, there's Sharon Bowler who got this whole thing started seven years ago uh, with her team at uh, Bottom Line Performance. And then uh, when uh, Bottom Line Performance was uh, joined with Tier One, uh, Jerry Hamburg was really instrumental in integrating this into our work. Big thank you to um, uh, our marketing and creative teammates, Michelle Bricking, Amanda Rapian, Sarah Urchwinder, Caitlin McCoy, Holly Badbury, uh, and also um, uh, Katie Coburn as well, we should add her. Uh, finally, I'll have to do a big thank you. We asked um, people, uh, some thought leaders, if they would sit with us with the data once we collected it, and give us their insights about the meaning of the data. And we spent uh, a couple hours with Rob Brinkerhoff, Hadia Nuruddin, Megan Torrance, Judy Hale, Nigel Payne. Um, if you don't know these names, you should. They're some of the top folks in the world in the learning and development space. And they gave us their insights and they sh shared with us some things that we would not have thought about. So a great thank you to them. Also, um, we... Uh, Earlier this year in January, we reached out to 48 thought leaders and we asked them to share their most important or their favorite content from the previous year. And they did that, but we also asked them if they would share some of their uh, thoughts on learning trends for 2022. And 30 of them did that. Uh, they shared things about the technology benefits to watch out for, but also the flip side where technology tends to be overemphasized, problems with the technology, 
Um, they talked about the benefits of utilizing the learning sciences, wisdom from outside of learning. Also the ways of working is changing and that has impact for us in L&D. And finally, they talked about improving our own L&D processes. So if you look through this list, you can see some people who are legendary in the field and some people are just merely, merely thought leaders, but really this is an amazing group and we're grateful for their uh, input. Okay, so now it's time. I put this slide in to remind me to tell you um, that we're gonna not just share stuff with you, but we're gonna also ask you for your reflections today. All right, now, one thing we did this year that we have not done before is we created this construct we're calling exemplary organizations. And if you go forward, uh, you know, the definition for exemplary is worthy of imitation, commendable, serving as a model. Well, what does that mean? We picked out um, respondents, you can go into the next slide, <clears throat> respondents um, who reported that their organizations were number one, successful in creating learning opportunities that improve work performance, and number two, that they used rigorous learning evaluation methods. Now, if you think about it, um, and the way we thought about it is, you know, people can tell us they're successful, but if they use rigorous evaluation methods, then we have a higher confidence that they are actually doing that. So what we did was for respondents who did both of these things, and we had a certain algorithm we used to figure this out, um, we categorized them as working in exemplary organizations. You're gonna see as we go forward through our uh, talk today, um, how this played out and whether it played out. So uh, keep that in mind. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Zach Ryland. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, thank you all um, both for kind of taking part in the the early kind of sample poll questions and for you know for joining us here in some of the background and context. What we'll do now is we'll go through um, high level section by section. Like Will said, there were over 100 pages in the full report that you all have access to in the chat and that we'll send out afterwards. We're just gonna give you some of the highlights here as a place for discussion. And like Will said, as a way to think about how they might impact you and your team going forward. So um, on the next slide, you can see we're getting into this section about professional development and the high level takeaway for professional development for us was that professional development across all of the respondents was conveniently informal, but that came at a downside. It did only produce modest returns. And you'll start to see that in the data that support the idea that we love listening to podcasts, but they may not have the transform the transformational impacts of something larger or more time consuming. So Sarah, you can go forward. Uh, one of the questions in the survey in 2021, where did you get most of your professional development? You can see here a big trend towards general interest learning. Again, those um, those kind of lightly informal things like a podcast or an HBR article, sometimes deeper dive like a book, but nothing quite as large as an outside workshop or a, a full on training provided by your organization. Um, and actually, this is one of the questions you all responded to just a moment ago, and your data looked very similar. 49% um, of you said general interest learning, 25% learning through work assignments, so the trends were pretty similar. Now the flip side of that you can see here is another question in the survey was asking, well, how did the overall quality of professional development, um, how, how was that impact? And the biggest response you can see there is, it slightly improved my work performance. There were certainly those that you can see a little under 10% had a transformational uh, advancement. Um, and many who said significant um, advancement, but slightly improved was almost half of the respondents. And I think there's a correlation here between that and the idea that we're using a lot of informal methods. Sarah, you can keep going forward. Here's a, a visual that just even calls out some of what Will introduced earlier. We know there's a slight difference in how our exemplary organizations answered these questions compared to the rest of the field, as you might say. And so if you look at that bottom row, when it comes to that effectiveness, 63% of exemplary organizations were in those upper categories of having significant or transformational improvement. Whereas again, the rest of us were more like 41% with uh, the, the bigger majority saying it was just some partial improvement. The last interesting tidbit here was that we were looking at the budget available and you can see lots of different budget numbers 
Um, but most people fell into this category of like, we have budget, but it's not specifically allocated. And we kind of interpret this to mean there's budget, but you have to ask for, for permission. And some of that may also indicate for us as a field that that process is introducing some barrier to our ongoing development, our ongoing learning as professionals. So maybe one of the things we can think about leaving today is that how might we change our processes to um, to make it easier to access those funds or at least encourage people to go forward with professional development. This next section is on our perception of what's trending and here we're we kind of always chuckle because there's always things that are almost a year away from being a year away they're kind of always on the cusp things like virtual reality or augmented reality come to the tips of our tongues. But we have some data here to talk about what's really trending or what methods and modalities will be hot as we go forward. And so the big key line takeaway here is that there are still a few traditional methods well known methods like e learning development that command our focus. But some things are emerging and they're not even necessarily technologies, some of them are uh, more psychology or behaviorally based so Sarah you can take us forward. Uh, what you're seeing here, and this is kind of a big graph is the methods that organizations will use in 2022 so the look at the deep blue bars those kind of top three are just the bread and butter of our industry e learning 80 plus percent of organizations are going to create some e learning next year. 75% give or take are going to create some version of online instructor led training, maybe like a VILT or a webinar. Um, and almost the same amount are going to create self guided learning and video. So those are those traditional standbys that are still here day in and day out. And Sarah, if you go forward, this next graph shows well, what about the things that you're going to use for the first time this year, like something brand new that you're just trying out. And here's where we see some of those technology, but also non technology driven elements. Um, you can see the third item there is the LXP, the learning experience platform, which is really hot in our field right now, and a lot of organizations are exploring. But number one is actually behavioral nudge campaigns, which is where we're seeing more of these behavioral economics, um, psychology, kind of human driven innovations that are coming forward in our field. So something to consider as you think about where your team is going this year. Um, as you look here, again, some disparities in our exemplary organizations up top our exemplary organizations have a more diverse set of methods that they'll use 51% of that whole list they'll kind of get into and then from a disparity standpoint you can just see there's gaps in certain topics exemplary organizations are more likely to visualize their data or to use adaptive learning or to get into things like design thinking um, with roughly a 20 to 25 percent gap in a lot of those categories. Lastly here if you go forward, you can see. There's a list of kind of the planned methods to use and just I won't read through these but they're in orange left to right, you can see the difference in some of the things that exemplary organizations will use. As compared to typical so research and evidence based practices is a big one you're seeing on the left hand side that the typical organizations are not digging into and uh, Walter and will will kind of talk about this as it skirts some of their topics a little bit later. So Sarah, you can go forward and here I'll hand off to Walter to talk about what we saw in the report related to the models, processes, and methodologies. Thanks, Zach. Um, so this is actually gonna be the first of a few little drive-by data dumps I'll commit on this call. Just a single slide here, but we, we asked a question about what kinds of things in, uh, informed learning and development design. So Sarah, if you go to the next slide here, um, this was a laundry list of things, the kinds of methods people are employing when they do their uh, design processes. And if you look from the top, there's a, there is a lot of audience engagement. We'll touch on this a little bit later, but it's largely qualitatively focused. And it's not until you get whatever that is, one, two, three, four, five, sixth most popular response here was actually one about developing uh, metrics in advance, which is often a, a best practice in any sort of method is to understand what you're gonna measure and define it. Also, this is one of the few, uh, Sarah, if you could go back one slide, please. Um, this is one of the only data sort of quantitative call outs we get in this entire list. Um, so uh, Will mentioned it in the terms of the definition of our exemplary organizations. Uh, it came up in the polling that we did initially where people reacted to what happened in question three. This isn't an argument that uh, quantitative data is the answer but it is an answer. And it is one of those things you need to, to understand where you're going and whether the things you're doing are working. So I mentioned before, I'm, I'm 
Bayesian. I'm not hard over on the inferential aspect, but you need to measure stuff. And I think this, this points to the fact that a lot of the design is a little bit more informal. It's a little bit more qualitative. So uh, again, just a drive by, we'll pick up on some of these themes later. And, and Zach, I think I'm handing it back off to you. Right. Thank you, sir. And obviously, Will has a section on LTAM and measurement here in just a couple more slides. So we'll see some of the impacts of that in the survey data as well. One thing that's interesting is uh, Will mentioned at the top, the survey was kind of redesigned and rebuilt this year different than how it's been in past years. So there were not, were not as many questions that had year over year comparison data, but one question that's persisted since the original authoring of this report was about how we include end users in, in our design and our development processes. And so the big takeaway here as we look at this year's data is, and I love being able to say this, there are statistically significant improvements in the inclusions of our end users, especially from last year as we come into this year. So Sarah, you can go forward. Here is a, a kind of three year, year over year comparison of that question using target audience or end users, using learners in our development process. And you can see here there's kind of differences in the never, occasionally, sometimes stack. But if you look down at the bottom at the always grouping, um, there is a big significant jump from 2021's 14% to this year's 25% of always including end users. Um, big for us, um, not only does it show, I think, the continued understanding of the importance of calling in end users in our work, um, but it also may be showing that we're recovering from kind of a COVID-related dip, where it was maybe hard or impractical to do that in our work, um, and we're coming back to not only levels that were equal to the past couple of years, but are even higher than the previous few years. So certainly something interesting for us, and I'd love in the chat to see, you know, maybe the methods, where do you all work end users or learners into your own processes. I am going to hand over to Will now to talk about learning evaluation. He's the man who has literally written a book on the topic. So Will, take it away. <laughs> Zach, did you practice that line? OK, so uh, let me I'm going to try to share my screen because there's a few things I want to point out. And I know I can't use uh, Sarah's laser pointer to do that. So Sarah, if you're going to allow me, uh, let me try this and uh, Hopefully it works all the way across the uh, Atlantic. How's that? Can you guys see my screen? Coming through. Awesome. All right. So uh, overall, uh, sort of the theme was we're doing better uh, than before, uh, but we as learning and development professionals are still not satisfied. So let's see what we might do differently. Um, all right. One of the questions we asked was, uh, in general, is your learning team able to do the learning evaluation that it wants to do? And our answer choices and our data uh, is here. And I'm just going to point this out here. So these are the no answers here, right? Are you able to do the learning measurement one, two, yes or no? So we have three yes answers and two no answers. First, let's look at the no answers. 65% of us, that's two thirds, are not able to do the learning evaluation that we want to do. Uh, <clears throat> some of us wanna make modest improvements. 46% of us would like to make significant improvements in our learning evaluation. Now, uh, if we look at the yeses, so there's a bunch of people who are mostly satisfied, but they continue to make improvements in their learning evaluation. Um, and then this group, this is the one that really depresses me. Yes, we are happy because we generally use sound research supported evaluation practices. Only 4% of us chose that one, which is maybe that's why this group is, is upset. Uh, and then the other group says, yes, for additional focus on evaluation will not be worth the investment for us. So maybe they're doing it really well. Maybe they don't care about evaluation. That was only 2%. And then 5% said, I do not know enough to say. Okay, so this is their general overall approach. Um, what did they actually do? We asked this question uh, in 2021, which evaluation metrics were most frequently used in your organization? And then we had this, uh, another additional specificity about this, select all, <coughs> excuse me, all that were used for more than one third of your learning programs. Okay, select all of them that were used for more than one third of your learning programs. And I know there's a lot here, so I'm going to go through this. Uh, 
This group up here, this is tier eight results. So this is things like organizational results, uh, revenues, costs, and things. This is the learner results, career progress, their wellness, salary increases, et cetera. The results impacting coworkers, family, friends, the results impacting community, society, et cetera. So this was the tier eight results. And you can see um, not much action on the coworkers or the so social responsibility aspects, um, a little bit on learners, but mostly we look at organizational results. We'll go on to tier seven transfer. This is the learner's actual work performance, observations, amount, quality of work products, et cetera. And you can see that was up at about the 25% level as well. Uh, learner demonstration, and this is the, this is where LTEM adds sort of some learning wisdom to the learning evaluation landscape. Uh, so we're measuring learner knowledge, learner decision-making competence, and the learner demonstration of task competence. Go now to the learner perceptions. We can measure those through surveys or uh, by other means. And you can see here that surveying is one of the top things we do still, our smile sheets, our learner surveys, along with measuring attendance. Now, one of the things I want you to know, these were these are indexed based on LTEM, but we didn't use, we never mentioned LTEM. We just gave people uh, qualitative uh, things to choose. So we can also take these qualitative things and turn them into uh, the Kirkpatrick uh, four level model. So ask the same question and with the same results, we can measure it out this way. So uh, level one, level two, if we measure learner knowledge, which typically gets done uh, with the Kirkpatrick itself four level model, the learner work performance, and then level four learning. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. These are almost up at like the 25% level for levels three and four. <clears throat> Compared to most uh, surveys of the industry, these are fairly high results. So that could mean one of two things, either our sample of really experienced people um, is doing more work in these areas, or we are beginning to move the needle on learning evaluation. So I've shared some stuff about learning evaluation. Now, I'd just like to ask you in the chat, what jumps out to you? Do you have any reflections? Do you think about what this means for you or your learning team or your organization? And I'm gonna leave it on the uh, LTEM uh, descriptors as I give you a chance to answer that. What did these learning evaluation numbers make you think? Thanks, Zach. <laughs> Carol, I love that. I always wonder why we get away with it, not doing it right. Ian Blake, by the way, Ian Blake is here. Ian is one of the uh, main characters in the second edition of uh, Performance Focused Learner Surveys. Way, Ian, people are aware that we need to improve. David says, I think there might be a bias in the respondents' profiles like some of the exemplary folks here. <laughs> David, that might be true, although <clears throat> one thing I didn't tell you was that when we use the exemplary criteria, our little algorithm to separate out exemplary from all the rest, only 11% uh, categorize themselves at the exemplary level. And Rich James uh, of Tier 1 says, not much has changed in a decade. And people are saying it's a lot of work. Wonder if technology is having an influence. Elham Arabi, yeah, well, Elham is the first person in the history of, of humankind to do a dissertation, a doctoral dissertation on LTEM. And uh, if I, you'd like a copy of her dissertation, I'm sure she will send it to you, but she's also given me permission. Uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Whipperman, love the granularity of LTEM. Thank you. Hey, Simon Fowler, how you doing? Long time. We got we to gotta connect some. Simon and I live in the same town. When I come back from Europe, Simon. All right. Great stuff in the chat. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move us forward. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights. All right. And with that, I am going to turn it over to 
whom? I think that goes to me, Will. All right. You'll need to, you want me to, I can, I can drive for now if you like. Uh, yeah, continue. So this is the second of my uh, drive-by data dumps. Um, there were a couple of questions here about the general environment, not just about learning and development, but about what's gone on for the last few years. So we asked people about impacts of COVID. So Will, if you want to go to the next slide here. So this was just a question straight up. How did COVID disrupt your learning team's ability to focus on strategic initiatives? I personally was shocked when I saw this. I mean, I, I didn't expect the whole world to be on fire, but I expected much more significant disruption. Um, and what I think we are seeing here, the, the modal response is just sort of modest disruption. Um, and then there are a fair chunk of people saying there was no disruption. So if that's true, great. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that people were able to continue keeping on like they kept on. But Personally, I, and Will and Zach and I talked about this a lot, maybe because I never showed up about it, but this, this, was, uh, this was shocking to me. So uh, if people also find it shocking, like Will, I'd, I'd love to see your comments in the chat there. Um, if we go on to the next slide, a slightly different angle, COVID-induced perhaps, but we asked folks where they were planning to work. And again, you can see this modal response here. I will work almost exclusively from home. It looks like our larger group has is more homebound than the, the folks on this call, but this is also a striking result. Um, there's some people who say they will work most almost exclusively in the office. This looks like a major transformation. Um, this is probably not unique to the learning and uh, development field. There's evidence that lots of people, given this little taste of work from home, will want to continue working from home. But this is this is very pronounced. Um, I guess this was less surprising to me, although when you look at those two, the COVID question and this question together, uh, this to me seems like it's a fairly disruptive or at least significant change in people's lives if they're primarily working from home. So again, I'll just ask you all to meditate on this fact, see if there's some interpretation there that escapes us. Well, and, and uh, just to do add up the numbers, these two, I will work mostly from home, but also at the office, I will work almost exclusively from home, adds up to 73% of people. Uh, which is, I, this blew my mind when I saw this. Yeah, it's, a, it's again, if we just talk in terms of disruptions in the non-pejorative uh, sense, this seems like a, a massive sea change. Um, and then, Will, if you go ahead, one more slide here. Uh, this is less surprising. We did try to, to break this down into smaller cohorts. Um, it's not surprising to me that independent consultants <laughs> plan on working almost exclusively from home. You start your LLC and the office is the bedroom. Uh, vendors, though, this was a slightly larger cohort than I expected. Um, I'm not going to make a ton of hay about this, but it does provide a little more context and perhaps uh, some insight into that shockingly large number on the previous slide. So that's all I have for that. And I think, Will, I'm handing back to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see you guys talk and chat about what you think this means, uh, this working from home thing. Uh, one of the, we actually, in the report, we cite another report about um, remote office work. And I was just looking at that data yesterday and it's amazing. Like they surveyed people from around the world and they asked them what percentage of you would recommend remote work, in other words, working from home um, to others, 97%. Uh, what, what percentage of you would like to uh, have remote work be a big part of your work life throughout the rest of your career? What percent? 97 percent. So uh, the, the world is changing uh, right now as we as we proceed through this. <laughs> yeah, and Will, I'll just jump in and add to something you'll have to see in the report, um, folks, is really interesting too the comparison that most of us say we're going to work from home but also many of us feel very connected, which may go at odds of our kind of natural understanding of, of kind of getting back face-to-face -face and in person. Lots of questions there about the social capital that we've stored up already that we're still using and um, able to build from in virtual environments. And, and I'm sure a lot of nuance to your own organizations. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, uh, Zach. Uh, that, the question about how connected do you feel with your coworkers uh, in the last, I think it was in the last three months or something, we worded it like that. 
And uh, as, as you shared there, Zach, uh, a lot of people feel pretty connected, not completely, not everyone is feeling completely connected, but a lot of people are feeling very connected. So oh, thank you, Zach. All right, I think this is my success in enabling work performance. So our number one thing as learning and performance professionals, it's to help people do their best work. Um, if we give them a learning intervention, we want them to understand, to be able to remember, to use what they've learned in their work. Okay, so how well are our respondents, are we as learning and performance professionals, how well are we doing? Well, uh, we have some strong indications. And if you look at this, uh, and these are the two, we have strong indications of success. We have undeniable evidence of success in improving employee work performance. So uh, if you add these up, this is 38%. Um, if you wanted to add the next one, we have confident intuitions of success. Um, you would, you know, get up to a much higher number. Um, but look at this one. We have no real idea of our success. 22% said that, which is kind of a little bit scary, I think. <laughs> and we have doubts about our success. Um, and there are a few people that have evidence that they've been unsuccessful. It's good to have honest people taking your survey. All right. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Walter. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, a little bit less of a drive-by here, uh, a series of results I want to review. Um, and we, we asked folks about what kind of work they were doing, how rewarding was it, how important it was to them, and how, how it likely impacted learners. So, well, if you go to the next slide, please. So, what kinds of learning focused work did you uh, do in your role as a learning and professional uh, development performance professional? So you kind of read down the, the left-hand side here, they're designing learning experiences. Yep, I get it. This is a, the second one is they're agitating for learning experience. This isn't, this isn't just business development. This is probably sharing the goodness and the importance of good learning. Get that. Participating in a significant way, um, this is your own personal development. As Zach called out earlier, a lot of this tended to be informal, but this was something that people spent time doing. Um, what else do we wanna say here? Evaluating learning outcomes. You can see things sort of trail off here. The modal response is clearly the building of learning. This is where we spend most of our time. Um, it's shocking, I guess, that some people did none of the above, but there you go, <laughs> <laughs> as well said, an honest survey. Um, if we go on to the next slide, here we asked people about their how this felt to them. Um, are you doing your best work? This to me has a little bit of a, a Lake Wobegon feel to it. Um, but again, hooray for us, there's a lot of satisfaction. I'm doing work that is mostly fulfills me. I'm doing the best work of my career. I'm doing work that makes a contribution. This is all great. So uh, clearly this isn't just passing the time. People are doing things that feel significant and important to them. Um, yeah, this and, is good news. And it's, it's like a slam dunk almost. I mean, if all these three are positive, and that's where we all feel we're, we're, we're either making a contribu contribution, we're doing fulfilling work, or we're doing the best work of our career. So, yep. Uh, and then if we'll go on to the next slide. So, I want to contrast this or use the previous slide as a foil to this. So, here we're talking about goals. What is it that you really hope that? all of this learning experience that you're developing does for learners. I see in this, and again, I'll, I'll defer to the, the smarter people in this room. I see a lot of work-centered and almost user-centered, which is a good thing, although much of this is sort of targeted toward, well, do they like it? Are they getting stuff that they think is correct and reasonable, and is it helping them do their job? It's not until you look kind of near the bottom where we actually start looking at things about like remembering and sort of this deeper, higher levels of learning, which again, I find interesting. And- Oh, come on, Walter, I'm, I'm troubled by it. I mean, yeah, you're creating long-term remembering is something I've been preaching for years. And, you know, our job as learning professionals, if we just create comprehension, it's not enough because people could comprehend, but then forget. So this is sort of one of the things we ought to be doing. And the fact that it's sort of down at the bottom, uh, not even being one of our goals is flabbergasting. 
<laughs> I, I will not argue with you there, Will, uh, but I will say in a non-confrontational way, this is interesting. <laughs> and um, it might, I know some of the previous slides we talked on uh, what kind of evaluation are we doing? And there was some, some chat about, well, maybe as professionals, we just, we don't wanna know, or it's easier not to know. This is, this is there's a, uh, there's gotta be a connection here between the kinds of things that would really be learner focused, that deeper stuff, our willingness to evaluate, our ability to evaluate, and maybe ignorance is bliss. So if I were to try to tie the three slides together, perhaps that's it. Yeah, and a great um, conversation in the, in the chat. You guys keep at it, that's good stuff there. Um, anything else to add, add there? Did I cut you off too soon there, Walla? Nope, all good. All right, so. I'm going to quickly summarize some of the things we found related to the exemplary organizations versus all the other uh, organizations. Um, re and remember, these were our two criteria. Um, and oops. Yeah. Okay. So some of my latest changes got disappeared. Oh, that's too bad. All right. That's fine. So you remember, oh, maybe they'll come later. Yeah, that's right. I'm just confused because I'm jet lagged. Uh, so uh, remember, we had these two criteria, and we selected uh, respondents who were working in uh, exemplary organizations for this reason. Uh, one of the things we found is that people on exemplary teams receive the same amount, about the same amount of professional development as all others. So not not, not much of a difference there. Um, we, but they felt, um, and. To a, to a larger extent, that they were receiving better professional development. Now, Elham, I saw you ask in the chat whether what kind of statistics we ran on these. Um, mostly we're sharing the sort of descriptive statistics. We did occasionally run um, uh, t-tests. Actually, I should I should defer to yeah. Walter. <laughs> yeah, so some of these, uh, the proportions here, you know, we looked at the Z scores, uh, looked to see if there were significant differences there. We um, the trend data that Zach mentioned, and we did lose some of our trend data. Previous versions of the survey, we preserved the same questions, but there we just looked at chi-square differences in the distribution of response responses. And, but as Will said, it's primarily descriptive um, and a little bit of eyeballing. Yeah, a little bit of eyeballing. And, and one of the issues we had, when you separate out exemplary organizations and you get down to an N of 25, then statistics become more difficult uh, to do. Um, let me share some other exemplary results. So uh, people on exemplary teams use more tools and methods. They um, also had some large, some of the largest differences were on supporting remembering and minimizing forgetting. And you can see these other things as well. So this is where the exemplaries outpace the typical. Um, and these are the, the differences, just a, you know, uh, one minus the other. Uh, <clears throat> When we asked people what kind of assets, learning assets were you creating, um, exemplary folks were creating more different types of learning assets uh, than people in typical organizations. Um, and you can see the kind of assets they were creating. On, I, on, and these are all, the ones I'm gonna highlight here are sort of aligned with what we know from the learning research. Online knowledge reinforcement, online practice, job aids, performance support, online mentoring, uh, designing learning events that are not related to training. All these things we know from the research are good to do, and the exemplary folks are outpacing all the others by fairly large margins here. Uh, people on exemplary teams are reporting using more innovative practices by a lot, 81% to 54, 78% to 51%. Um, so, wow. And finally, people in exemplary teams are doing more best work of their career, 45% to 19%. Although, if we look closely at the data, um, uh, sort of the top answer here, best work of my career, exemplaries are much higher than typical, but it sort of then evens out over the first three, uh, mostly fulfills and makes a contribution where the exemplaries have a lower level. So just to be a little bit more balanced about that. So yeah, here's the fancy one I was gonna show you. So here we have our criteria 
And uh, these are the findings, right? Better professional development, more innovative practice, more tools and methods used, more types of learning assets, more use of research aligned practices, more likely to be doing their best work. Now you might think, oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> so if this is true, this causes this, but it could actually be the opposite, right? It could be doing some of these things over here, getting better professional development, using more innovative practices enables you to create more successful learning events. Um, and maybe there's some back and forth here. Just wanted to point out that this wasn't necessarily causal. I can see Zach nodding his head. Great. That's such a classic, right? Correlation, not the same as causation. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's right. All That's right. So we have zoomed through a lot of stuff here um, in this report. Um, question you might have, well, what are the ways I can use this? So we brainstormed a few ways and you can probably think of others, but obviously, you know, individually, we can read the report and reflect on what it means. Uh, we can gather our team together and read, reflect, and we can create action plans as well. Uh, we can then with our team modify our learning strategy and our learning tactics. Uh, the other thing we could do is we could answer the questions ourselves. We could get all, all the people on our learning team and we could answer the survey questions and then we could look at our results compared to the typical results or the all, all results versus or compared to the exemplary results. Um, we're, we, we kind of we're kind of itching to know what you think about this one, benchmarking against other, uh, actually taking the survey and then sort of gathering your team together, looking at your averages compared to sort of the survey averages. Love to hear what you think about that uh, in the chat. Um, or if you have other methods here, um, we're going to have time for questions, but uh, you might now share with us what other ways do you think you could use a report like this? And I know probably you haven't read all 100 plus pages. <laughs> um, there will be a quiz at the end of the week. I'm just concerned. Okay. And, and as you're contemplating that, um, again, we mentioned we didn't have time to go into uh, a lot of this. Um, we tried to cover stuff to get you intrigued and to have good conversation here in this webinar. Um, Oh, now I can't read my own stuff. I was going to put these in small. And so there's a whole, there's a list of things of design methodologies people use, of the tools they use. You want to take a look at all those details. Um, we've got a lot of like methods on there this year that you may not have heard of it that are, you mm. know, have come out, come out of the research, like the four CIP model and uh, things like that. Yeah, there's some uh, great discussion in there on why methods are even helpful to us, the variety of things that they cover and help us remember to do as professionals. Um, people shared with us, we were asking them about their professional development sources. Uh, we asked them an open-ended response, who are your trusted thought leaders, the people that you would recommend to others in the field? They gave us a list of names and we gave you the list of the top 20, something like that. Um, in the learning evaluation section, we did an open-ended response and got people's feedback about learning evaluation. And they have a lot of good lessons learned in there, um, in their comments. Um, and then there are our thought leaders who shared, we have over 30 thought leaders and they shared at least one idea for a trend this year. And these are the people that, and I know sometimes we don't like the word thought leader. Um, it rubs us the wrong way, et cetera. But I, I have never, never been able to figure out a better word, but these people are out there thinking about our industry and the work that we do. And uh, if they see some trends, uh, these are the type of people that I would uh, want to take a look at. That's right. All right, Q and A. Uh, All right, yeah. Um, go ahead and drop your questions in the chat. We do have one here from Ian. He asks, uh, "How can we find an online replacement for the informal learning, knowledge sharing, creation that happened in classroom training, the chats over lunch at coffee machines, and from the building of new relationships?" Mm -mm -mm. Uh, so I, I might represent a uh, an interesting opinion here. I, I don't know if we can. I am the kind of the category that if you look at some of the research on social capital specifically, I'm of the belief that we're kind of running on pre-existing social capital for those types of things that you're calling out. Um, there's some great stuff in the chat. We've proven we can do the work 
digitally. And I think that's what your question kind of alludes to. Can we keep up the serendipitous connections, the networking, the, the relationship building virtually over a long period of time? I don't know if we have a, a good answer for that. There's a lot of different approaches, but I'll say one of the more interesting informal pieces of professional development I've done um, HBR in a study they did found probably we cannot that like the virtual happy hour just isn't working. Trying to have a beer with a bunch of people in squares is not quite the same. Um, Will Walter, I don't know what you all think about that. Well, I'm more of an optimist, Zach. I think we haven't figured it out yet. So it's not really fair to compare what we're doing right now with what, you know, what might have been. Good. Um, so uh, in fact, you know, tier one has a tool called Coffee Talk, which is actually a pretty cool tool. And it allows you to sort of schedule, um, uh, you, you get a whole bunch of people and you put them on a list and then you, uh, it randomly assigns you a coffee chat, like a 15 minute chat, or it could be 30 minute chat once a week or once every two weeks on any schedule you want um, and uh, get together. We've used it uh, at tier one. I love it. Um, I know I have a, a coffee talk coming up with Josiah Holland. Looking forward to that. And uh, we've used it in other ways as well. So uh, if, if Sarah, if you know more about coffee talk, but I, I, my, my, I guess my point is that we're going to figure this out. There's ways to do it. Um, and it may depend person to person as well. That's true. I'll offer yeah. a third opinion here. Uh, being an introvert, I love the fact that I don't have to talk to anyone. But, um, I have found, and I, I'm also curious, like Will, I think there are there are changes ahead. And certainly one of them, the last two years have been a raft of, for many people, wall-to-wall -wall meetings from yes. 8 a.m. to 5. Hard times for people to spend exclusively locked into to scheduled meetings. When that relaxes a little bit, um, I've always worked remotely. It's it's still possible, I think, to have those informal conversations when somebody just picks up and does the quick video chat with you about whatever problem du jour. So again, like Will, I think when schedules are a little bit more relaxed and if people, if the, the uh, habit develops that you can just reach out to somebody and chat with them over a screen, that I think could afford some of those informal opportunities to talk through a problem, get somebody's perspective. So I'm, I'm also a little bit more sanguine. Yeah, yeah. One, one last kind of small note for me is just obviously, Will, to your point, two years of kind of thinking about this problem is not the same as the many decades we had of, of working in offices before. And, and one interesting kind of tidbit of related but not quite directly data is I'm intrigued by this idea that like the virtual working world is helping to, to get rid of this glass ceiling notion for women that are professionals, that it's offering more flexibility and interested in maybe the damage that might come out of trying to rush back to the in-office environment that we may be we may be hurrying to this year, or maybe next year. That's probably better served for like our International Women's Day panel, since you just happen to have three guys by coincidence here. But an interesting topic, nonetheless, from an equality standpoint. Sorry, Will, didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's that's a very important point. I'm glad you brought that up. I think we would be remiss not to have mentioned that um, <clears throat> in that remote report we cited earlier. Um, they do talk about you know some of the hidden costs of uh, working in the office, like travel time, like cost of gasoline, like pollution, all kind of uh, things. So I, I think the world is complex. Oh, very much so. Awesome. Well, I, it looks like we have covered the questions, a lot of great chat happening. Um, and yes, lots of, it looks like we have lots of follow-up topics. So I think a, a follow-up discussion um, would make a lot of sense. The other thing I wanted to call out on the coffee talk that is during COVID, we, it was a software um, that we had built internally, but we offer that to any organization for free of charge. So you're welcome to use that. And yes, Mountain Seed is a, um, a user and fan. So it sounds like they've had great results with that. It, so if you're interested, I dropped the link. Otherwise you can always just reach out to us at hello at tier one performance.com. You can um, connect with, you know, Zach, Will, Walter. We're always happy to connect. 
Uh, Will, could you advance one slide here? I just wanted to call out our uh, Tier 1 Performance Institute. So as many of you may know, we launched Tier 1 Performance Institute as a way to really um, look at performance science and look at how we can use that to create healthier, high-performing organizations. And um, we're about to launch a lot of new offerings. So if you want to follow tier1performance.com, performance hyphen institute, we'll include that link in the um, follow-up email with a recording, but would love to have you join us there as well. And again, any questions or follow-up, please reach out. You'll be getting that email um, within the next couple of days. So you can always just reply back to that as well. And, thanks and, to everyone for joining and a special thanks to Will, Walter and Zach for all the work that went into this report. And um, hope we just hope that it helps spark lots of conversations and actions among your teams.